The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the July edition of Digging Into the BI. This is where the, the people from the D.C. regional chapter and the Maryland chapter get together and look at the latest issue of Better Investing and the stocks that are, are being featured for this month. So there are the four stocks we're going to be looking at tonight, and uh, it's pretty straightforward. And let's go to the next slide, Cheryl. And here's our standard disclaimer. We're doing these presentations for educational purposes only. Um, as BI investors, we really uh, strongly suggest that you re do your own analysis and review of this. Uh, we're doing this just for our, our uh, for educational purposes. And if we show a site, we're not necessarily promoting or endorsing that site. And we are recording this, so it will go up on our YouTube channel. Next slide, please. So. Uh, for those people that are not part of the better investing community, although I think most of us are, uh, but if you're watching this uh, as a taped on uh, uh, YouTube, you may want to know who we are. We're an investment education organization, and that first one down there is a hyperlink that will take you to better investing, but it's going to be the link that's right up at the top uh, there at betterinvesting.org. And we are focused on long-term fundamental investing and all of us that are here presenting tonight are volunteers in the D.C. or Maryland chapters. Next slide. And so Better Investing, again, is an investment education where we learn by doing. There are two of the people that sort of were at the beginning, Tom O'Hare on the left and George Nicholson on the right. Um, and again, we believe in doing your own investment education, and that's exactly what we're doing tonight. Next slide. So here's the YouTube channel we talked about. Uh, and if you download these slides, and we'll show you in a future one how to get to it, but all where Cheryl's sort of circling that, that's a that's a hyperlink that you can go to our YouTube channel, or you can just go to YouTube and type in digging into the BI and you will see it. Um, and you'll be able to see our old recordings. Next slide. And for those people that are new to go to a webinar, uh, this is just sort of helps you. We always have questions about how to navigate things. So over on the right-hand side where the green circles are, if that's in your way, you can grab and move those left, right, up, down to get out of it. If you want to expand it, you can click on that arrow, and that will open and, uh, open and close it. Um, and uh, then we also, you automatically be muted but you can be able to sit there and uh, when we get to question time, um, Richard will sit there and we can unmute people and you can ask your question then by raising your hand or you can also type into the question box and we'll take those during question time. And it's easier if you pull out the questions to be able to type it. Next slide. So if for people that are having, a you know, maybe a little bit new to this, uh, to improve your viewing, the first thing is you can zoom. You can make it, uh, you know, it generally defaults somewhere in the mid 80s, but if you hit that drop down window where the one is that I highlighted, you can have it fit the entire screen so it will be able to be easier and bigger for you to be able to take a look at, at things. Um, the other thing is, is that we go through things pretty fast. Uh, you may want to click the screenshot if there's something that you want to be able to think about later. And also with the next slide, um, uh, we'll we'll show you how to be able to get the um, the handouts. Actually, that was like two slides ago. But uh, when you pull out this, yeah, let's go back. Uh, I think it's like slide five or six. Go back one more, two more. Yeah, there it was. It was on slide seven. So this is for our audio problems, but more importantly, there's the handout. So if you see where that green arrow is pointing to, that's where we want, if you want to be able to download the presentation, the slide deck for tonight, as well as the four completed SSGs, that's where they are. Make sure to download them. If you are having trouble uh, hearing the audio, we can hear each other. So just check on your audio settings there, sort of the purple one. And the help one is sort of the red line that will sort of help you uh, to stuff on go to webinar. So let's go to the next slide. We already talked about this, so let's move on. And uh, we there we go. And then so 
here we are, you know, why we're doing this. Uh, we're trying to be able to show the resources you get through Better Investing Magazine. And again, Cheryl's showing a hyperlink that if you're not a member of Better Investing, you can be able to get a free 90-day trial. You'll be able to see this hyperlink if you actually download the handout, so make sure to do this. Um, we're, we're doing this to be able to help out beginners, people that are uncertain of their judgments, or people that really just want to get the best practices. And this is something that's done by both of the Mid-Atlantic chapters, the Maryland and the D.C. Regional. We promote our three model clubs, and we have a visit a club program. But you don't have to be in the Mid-Atlantic region to enjoy this. Next slide. So in just over an hour, we're going to look at four stocks. We're going to do the two featured stocks, which is the stock to study and the undervalued feature. Those you get to have if you're a BI member. And then the others come from the BI community. They're either going to be from First Cut or the Weekly Screens or Ticker Heat Map, Top 100, whatever. But those are some of the other places. But we're always going to find them from somewhere inside the BI community. Next slide. And if you want to be able to find out how we got to it, uh, and again, you don't have to be a member for this. If you see where the highlighted yellow is under About Us, uh, if you just go to betterinvesting.org, you will be able to see all the announcements for all the upcoming ones. These for this month, tonight, were announced on April 18th, and they're the ones that are in the red circle. So you can see you have several months to be able to take a look at all those things that are coming up. Next slide. And if you are a member and you want to be able to get news on future stuff, here you can go over on the right-hand side once you sign in under my account. From there, you want to go over to the left where the green circle is, sign up for the email and product subscription information. And what will pop out is the green box that's there in the middle. And you can sign up for your local news. And before you hit that save changes, I would suggest suggest you go up to where the yellow highlight is with the BI Weekly Newsletter. And if we go to the next page, we'll show you what that does. This comes from uh, headquarters uh, outside Detroit, and they will show you some of the latest upcoming things that are going on. One of which is there's been some new changes to the online data tools, and they're going to have that as part of the stock up in August. And as a member, you can sign up for it. This comes out at the close of business on Thursday. And if you signed up and you don't see it, check your spam filter. Next slide. So we're also on Facebook, both the uh, Maryland and D.C. regional chapters. So you don't have to be a member and you can find us there as well. Pretty straightforward. Next slide. Cheryl, why don't you tell us what's going on in the D.C. chapter? Cheryl, uh, we didn't hear you, so you may not have been muted, or you may have been muted. There we go. All right. The D.C. chapter puts on a monthly Money Matters book discussion, uh, and the one in July is coming up. It's the third Tuesday of every month, and that will be on the 19th from 7.30 to 9 p.m., so if you go over to our local events and click on this Money Matters book discussion, it will tell you what the book is for this month as well as the next month. Thank you. Let's go to our next slide. Okay. And Cynthia, you're with the Maryland chapter. You want to tell us what's going on in the Maryland chapter? Sure. So the Maryland chapter... What's going on now? And again, like Cheryl said, if you go over to the website and you go to news and events, you'll see that we have the top 100 uh, that was featured last month. And you can click on that and get information on that. We also have local events at the top. You can click on it and actually list out what we have going on. Um, it's so small on my screen. But right now we have the 2022 Stock Pickers Contest. And it does give you a little blurb about it, about what it is and what we do. So if you're interested for the Maryland, what's going on in the Maryland chapter, click on that link, learn a little bit more about us, and we would love to hear from you. Thank you. Let's go to our next slide. Uh, and Kent, you want to tell us about uh, the Maryland Model Club? Sure. So let's see, the Maryland Model Club meets the second Saturday of the month, which means we just met this past Saturday. We meet remotely, as uh, many of the clubs are doing. 
Uh, nominally, we would be meeting in the library over in Savage. <clears throat> and this past month, we had uh, folks talk about their experience at Bink, and we had uh, FedEx uh, as a stock study there. So be very, uh, very good to see uh, the FedEx study here as well. So thank you very much. That's it. Thank you. Um, Cynthia, back to you and tell us about your club. So I belong to In the Black Investment Club. We're an online club. Again, we meet strictly online. We have members, nine members, nine partners rather, and they are spread out between somewhere on the East Coast, <laughs> Maryland, Virginia, and New York, I believe. Uh, we meet the second Sunday of each month in the evening at 7.30 p.m. to 9. And our educational discussion this upcoming in August, August 14th, will be Fundamentals of Investing. We are just opening up to guests and allowing that come August 14th. So we'll be starting that and our information will be on the website, BI website to inform everyone that we are taking visitors to the club. Our stock to study is to be determined and I am your point of contact. There's my email address and would love to hear from you and anyone wants to come and visit the In the Black Investment Club. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. And this is my club. Uh, along with a couple other people that are on here tonight, but the Montgomery County Model Investment Club. We meet on the third Wednesday of the month, so that means July 20th. There's our link. You don't have to be a member to come on in. Um, we're going through the Adding Judgment series that started in uh, March of this year and ran through April uh, just to sort of help boost our, our knowledge in those areas. So we're sort of starting with that. And our stock to study will be Boot Barn Holdings. And if you have any more information or you want to reach out to us, you can click on that. Or you can reach us at that email address. Uh, let's go to our next slide. All right. So this is the Model Investment Club of Northern Virginia, which I am a member. I'm Cheryl Patterson. Um, we started in 2008. We have currently have 12 partners. Um, we meet on the second Tuesday of the month. Um, we do have mostly uh, online uh, meetings, but we will be meeting every once in a while over at the Tyson's Pimmett Library. I believe August will be the next time we'll be meeting at the library as well as online. There's the online link um, or, or you can dial in. There's the phone number. Uh, the education is going to be adding ETFs into your portfolio and the stock to study is Cohart. Uh, we greatly appreciate visitors and uh, there is the point of contact if anyone wishes to get more information or to find out some information about the club. Janet, you want to tell us about your club? Certainly. Um, Joan Lamb of Beta Sigma Phi Sister started our club in 1996. So we are celebrating our 26th anniversary this month. Uh, we have uh, 13 members. We have 22 stocks on our portfolio uh, at a valuation of about a little more than 582,000 um, the last time I checked. Our oldest stock is RPM and our newest one is Visa. Uh, we each monitor several stocks because we have more stocks than we do members. And we meet by Zoom on the first Thursday of every month. And we would love to be contacted, especially if you're in the Prince William County area and uh, contact me at that email address. I used to have a business, I no longer have it, but I still keep that address. Thank you. And uh, you're, you'll be presenting, this will be the eighth different club that will be presenting uh, tonight uh, over the life of this. Cheryl, tell us about Visit the Club program. Well, we have uh, clubs that have listed with us uh, that they are looking for members. Uh, so if you just click on Visit a Club, you will see the different listings uh, for both the Maryland chapter, if that's what you are, are plugged into, or the DC regional, if that's where you went to. Um, also, uh, for clubs that are looking uh, for some education or just some information and assistance in, in 
get going or keep going, um, you, we, you can contact us uh, as a director coming to visit your club and offering education or uh, whatever the club needs. And so uh, you, I will have my email later on in the presentation and you can then contact me to see about getting a director to either virtually or physically attend your club. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, since this is digging into the BI, we want to be able to remind people that rather than just waiting for it in the post office, you can be able to get this either on your app, that's actually from my phone on the left side, um, or you can sit there and uh, get it in an e-magazine and you can read it on your uh, computer, laptop, tablet, smartphone, whatever electronic device you have. Um, so you'll get it uh, maybe up to a week in advance of when um, uh, it normally appears in your mailbox. So consider that. Next slide. Um, and we'll be talking about uh, things, particularly with the featured stocks, uh, the analyst reports and other resources, the red arrow. Uh, anytime that there's a featured stock, there's additional information where that red arrow is. And let me back up a little bit where the green arrow is. If you want to learn how to be able to put those mobile devices onto your phone or whatever, because it's a different sign in than what you have for your BI magazine. Took me a while to figure that out. Uh, click on that green one and you'll be able to find it. Next slide. And so we always feature a, a particular article from the current issue. And this one, I decided to look at the international column. It comes out quarterly or thereabouts. And when I've looked at this, they're generally not the up straight and parallel type of stocks that we sort of talk about in the BI community. But what I find really interesting is that if you read the column, you can sort of understand the author's thought process and reasoning. And while it may not necessarily be a core holding, it may be something that there could be some benefit to. So I've always found and I always tend to look at that. It's just another place to get a different idea of something I didn't, a company I didn't know anything about. Next slide. And then finally, uh, always look at the investor events column. Uh, this is on page 51 of this one. Uh, they are completing their, their three-step process, uh, the online uh, value line that Marty Eckerley is doing, and that's done with the Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana chapter along with the Oregon chapter, uh, and that's uh, free. And there's a whole bunch of things that are free. Uh, the Philadelphia chapters put stuff up there, Pittsburgh chapter has. So go ahead and take a look at that. You may find some things that you can attend just like this for either no cost or for a very small nominal cost. Next slide. Well, we want to be able to talk about stocks, so let's get into it. We're going to have our first two stocks are going to be in core SSG, and we'll start with Cynthia, and she'll tell us all about FedEx. So take it away, Cynthia. Thanks, Gavin. Next slide, please. So my name is Cynthia Williams. I am a volunteer with the Maryland chapter of BI. I am also, you heard earlier, that I am a member or partner with the End of, In the Black Investment Club, and I'll be speaking about FedEx today with the ticker sign FDX, so don't, the New York Stock Exchange. I found this um, in the Maryland, I'm sorry, in the May 22 edition um, of the magazine um, under growth stock column. Next slide, please. And here's the column here. Uh, it was The column was put out by Cy Lynch, and he spoke about FedEx as, and many other stocks but this one he says fedex corps continue to report sales growth about about predict about my predictions leading me to increase my sales growth projection to seven percent so remember that seven percent because i did a little caveat later on the presentation but if you want to look at this uh article take a look at it it's in the 22 edition the may 2022 edition of the bi magazine next slide please FedEx, uh, this FedEx Corp was founded in 1971 by Fred Smith. It's based out of Memphis, Tennessee. FedEx is a blue chip company um, that provides air, express, and ground package delivery service. They're best known for their element of day certain and time critical delivery to residents, to both residents and businesses globally. Um, they also have uh, truck freight. Uh, they have logistics and other services, and I'll get more into those uh, later in the presentation. Next slide, please. 
So how FedEx makes money? Let's talk about that. So FedEx Corporation provides overnight door-to-door -door delivery of packages and documents through its own air ground transportation system. FedEx operates more than 200,000 ground vehicles. Uh, they have 696 aircrafts. They serve more than 220 countries and territories and delivery, and they, I'm sorry, delivers in, in an increase of 16 million shipments daily. Next slide, please. So here's FedEx portfolio of services. Uh, you're familiar, more, you may be from more familiar with FedEx Express, Ground, and Office. Office formerly known as Kinko's, so now it's FedEx Office. So just to take a little bit and share a little bit about each one of them. <clears throat> so the Express segment of uh, FedEx accounts for 51% of total revenues. FedEx Express connects with the world with time defined Air and Ground Services is the world's largest cargo airline and express transportation company, which covers every U.S. street in the U.S., every street address in the U.S. And as mentioned before, it covers more than 220 countries and territories. This global networks provide a time-sensitive air ground express through 650 airports, and they have a team of 250,000 members, and I mentioned the, six, not the 696 aircrafts, 86,000 motorized vehicles, and an average of 6.2 million packages moved daily. A little bit about the sec, uh, about the ground segment, which is 33% of total revenues, offers fast economical delivery in the U.S. and Canada, and is faster than more two more locations than UPS. Yes, I mentioned its competitor <laughs> in the U.S. Um, 100,000 motorized vehicles. They do uh, upwards of 10 million packages move daily, and they do it through 690 facilities with 200 thousand team members. Uh, a little bit about the freight segment. So let me tell you about that. 10% of this accounts, 10% of the revenue. Um, simplify, what they do here is they simplify the LTL, which stands for less than truck load. So LTL, less than truck load shipping in the US, Canada, Mexico, Puerto Rico, and the US Virgin Islands. This one has roughly 47,000 teammates moving this mail um, through 400 service centers, and they do about 110,000 segment um, shipments daily. 6% of the revenue is the FedEx Logistics. This connects, um, FedEx Logistics connects supply chain globally, um, and some of their initiatives fall under air and ocean cargo networks. Custom brokerage, customs brokerage, brokerage and trading solutions, and I mentioned before the supply chain services. They do this over 34. I'm sorry, 34 countries served, uh, with about 21,000 teammate members, and then they also handle about 5.9 million customs brokerage transactions annually in the North America. Less than a half, um, less than a percent of the revenue is your services. This is where teammates coordinate um, sales, marketing, communications, information technology, and customer service support. Um, some of their initiatives are FedEx Delivery Manager, the, Sen the Sense Aware Suites, and FedEx Innovations moving forward. Next slide, please. Here, I just wanted to show you a few numbers. Uh, the the top graph shows you the uh, fourth quarter numbers, the end of fourth quarter numbers. Um, if you look at the revenue, it's uh, uh, 24.4 billion, um, and that's about 8% more than they did um, supply, which is same period last year. The bottom graph gives you a little bit about their revenue yearly, um, from year to year, 93.5 billion, where they did uh, about six to almost 7% more than the 84 billion they did last year. So just wanted to give you a snapshot of the numbers, uh, end of quarter and uh, a whole year. Next slide, please. Now we're moving into the SSG core uh, and that's where I did my, my write up with the SSG. So FedEx Corp here, we're looking at the historical sales. If you notice what we look for straight up in parallel, we have those nines doing that here. Uh, their, their, growth, uh, their growth rate was 
0.8%, um, according to the chart. And if you look down, what I like to compare with these are the peer group average and the industry average. And they're slightly over with the cells uh, for those two groups, the peer at 5.9 and the other was 5.8, where FedEx is 8.8. .8. Next slide, please. Here is the historical earnings, just a little up and down <laughs> here with this one, but here they are at 9.8% growth for the APS um, and core. And again, I compare it to the peer and industry. If you look down there, even though they're a little shaky and bumping down in 18, uh, where there were some bumps, we have uh, still with the industry and the peer at 9.7 and 9.3 respectively. Next slide, please. Five minutes. Mm -hmm. FedEx Corp here, I compare it to the peers. Again, I did highlight who was doing better with the stars, but again, my focus is always looking at where they are compared to the peer and industry. Uh, you have your pre-tax profits uh, where they have 4.6, slightly under the peer and industry, return on equity is 14.4, well under the industry and peer, but if you think about the S&P 500, 14 is a standard average, so they're close, as long as we're not below 10%. Debt to capital, FedEx is 56.5, and then the peer and group is a little over that. So just to kind of show my comparisons where I can kind of draw my conclusions when I do my forecast. Next slide, please. Here, I, I usually do a spreadsheet off to the side to kind of compare uh, the analysts that I look at and do an average, but also with what's in core. So across the top, you'll see sales and EPS, the benchmark the uh, the morning star ACE two year estimate. Then I have the analysts that I look at morning star and value line, and I average those out. I use that against the ten a year average, which is in the graph at the top. So if you look at historical sales and millions right below that, you'll see the ten years across the and you see 8.8%. So I look at all of these numbers when I come up with my forecast. I thought 8% was fine because I did see the growth for the sales going straight up in parallel. So I went with eight, a round number as opposed to 8.8, .8, even though the average for the two analysts were 7%. So this is what I look at and I just highlighted the 137,400 and you'll see why we'll move to the next slide. But 8% estimate growth rate results five years, projects the 137,400. Right below that is the EPS. And again, the eight, uh, I'm sorry, the 10 years gives us the 9.8%. If you look back at the top of the graph for EPS, the second row, the uh, five-year benchmark is 5.7. 11.6 is what's in core, but then your 11 point and your 13 point for Morningstar or Value Line average, those three averages out to 12, which is pretty high compared to the 10 and the five. But I did go with the nine only because Cynthia is a little aggressive. <laughs> so don't mind that. Underneath that, I did highlight the 22.5 because I used that when I moved to the next as well. Next slide, please. Here I have uh, the high price and the low price to forecast. Uh, I just highlighted that 22 you saw on the other slide and that 1905. What I did here was go with the current PE for the high price at 10, I'm sorry, 16.2 times that high price at forecast, which gives me a high price, stock price of 367.2. Underneath that is the low PE. I went with the five-year average low PE at 10.6% times the 1905, giving me a low stock price forecast of 201.9. You'll see that on the next slide. Again, across the top, I just gave, showed a little bit of my spreadsheet that I use when I look at numbers making comparisons. Next slide, please. Two minutes. Here's risk and reward is the uh, shows on this slide, and it shows you where the current stock price of 231.3 as of Friday the 10th came in at, and it comes in as a moderate buy at 4.3 to one. Um, and I kind of gave you a snapshot of everything here, the forecast payout. It is a dividend company. You do get dividends. With the 24.8, it gives you an annual rate of return at 10.6% and the 2. Uh, percent yield. So just wanted to show you that again, moderate buy on this scale according to that using the 9%. Next slide, please. At the beginning of the presentation, I, I mentioned Cy Lynch. Just 
his projection at 7%. So I wanted to look at it at 7% and I'm showing you that snapshot here. I did use the 7% here and brought up the risk and reward. It still comes in as a moderate buy. The 231.3 as of Friday um, falls in slightly, um, almost out of the buy, but again, moderate buy. And here it gives you the 3.2 to one and the rate of return at 9.9, .9, slightly under 10%, which we try to go there and above. And then the current yield still, that dividend is at 2%. Next slide, please. Uh, FedEx Corp and risk and rewards. Uh, risks and then moving forward, um, just wanted to kind of share with you some of the things you may want to consider when you do this study on this, if you decide to move forward, is pandemic, uh, pre-pandemic noise returning. More, I should have said, restrictions are being lifted, if you will. So that right there kind of throws a little flag in it, only because during the pandemic, people were at home, people wanted things right away, they wanted to come to the house, they, they used the time sensitive, the day service certain ground and air for FedEx. So the numbers were looking good with FedEx Express. That may take a little hit now, now that everything is being more relaxed. Slowly, um, the slowing economy may be an issue with uh, FedEx. Um, uh, if we stay in this recession, um, macroeconomics um, may keep us there. So, and then uni unionization, um, it's not a big, risk. It's not a big to do, but it is in the news a little, and it's uh, a more about the freight and them trying to utilize, unionize. But again, it's not a big hoopla, but I would say keep your eye on that if you do the research on this. Forward movement, uh, the 50 years that has been in business, the new C uh, CEO has now stepped to the side and he has actually passed the torch, but the passed the torch to Raj. I don't want to mess his last name up, so I call him Raj S. Uh, he has the, has the torch now. He's taken the lead, his charge, and the great thing about him, he's been with him for about 20 years, so he knows his workings, he knows the foundation. However, he's willing to look into the new wave in tech, which is tech and innovations. So they're looking at blockchains, they're looking at many things such as that. Uh, okay, and then in the conclude, uh, the FedEx is a large moderate company. Um, it's well-managed company. It's fully priced um, trading at um, its forecast five-year average PE of 16.2 of and then FedEx is a buy up to 189.90, three to one for the 15% total return. And then FedEx is a moderate buy and a candidate to consider adding to your watch list and keeping an eye on it closely. Um, I look at it as a buy the dip stock. It's a great opportunity to do that. And I believe, next slide, concludes my presentation. Thank you, Kevin, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you, Cynthia. Great job. Okay, and I'm going to talk to you about the stock to study from this month, which is global payments. And let's get into it and let's go to the next slide. Um, back up one. There we go. So, yeah, uh, this is just sort of where it is in, in there. Um, I won't read you the entire things. So make sure to download the handouts. But, you know, some significant developments were the acquisition of Total System Services in 2019. So, about six months before uh, the pandemic, dividend rate went up. Uh, they're in a highly competitive environment, and they really sort of concentrate on the small to mid-sized companies that generate uh, uh, sales volume or payment volume of somewhere a half a million to six hundred thousand and up. Um, and that's sort of where their sweet spot is. Next slide. So here's sort of the outline. They're in the S and P 500, medium size on sales. Um, it has a history that goes back to 1967, but the, the core of this has been when they spun off in 2001, um, and this is where they are. Competitors over on the uh, right-hand side, Block was pretty uh, clear. I have different ones than what were, were in the um, the BI magazine, and we'll talk about that as we go through. And I always like to look to see when it was initially selected, what the price was, 140.21 and what it was on Friday, 113.28. So it's down 19% since then. So that's either it's a falling knife or it could be a potential uh, big buyer. Um, and there are the three segments, merchant solutions and issue solutions, and then business consumer. Let's go to the next slide. So they started 
uh, the guy was a retired Air Force uh, man. I got tried to golf for a year, didn't like it, and started a company that was called National Data Corporation. And they were the people that originally gave verification for um, gas stations to be able to use a credit card. Uh, they'd call in a number, and 20 seconds later, they'd tell you whether the card was valid and whether you could use it. And that's sort of the origins of where they started. And within uh, a year of that, they were already an IPO. Next slide. So I like to look at the CFRA stock report um, when it does have a star rating, in other words, an analyst following it, they really have a nice uh, information on the second page that sort of outlines what they do. A lot of this comes from basically their SEC filing. So if you don't want to read an SEC filing, but you want to get the details, here's some of the things to sort of take a look. I'll zero in on the market profile. They sort of compete in what's called the mid-market merchant acquiring. So they do things like, for example, um, let's say a university has um, a payment plan for uh, people that are using um, the cafeterias and stuff. They're actually, uh, the people will pay into it through a global payments. And again, for every transaction that they do, they just take a small percentage out of everything that uh, comes in there. Um, they've, uh, they generally have had a very strong cash position. Um, although right now they have a debt of $10.8 billion, but they've been able to generate fee, free cash flow of $1.8 billion just in, the, in, in 2020. And uh, because of that, they're able to reduce their debt and they're repurchasing shares and keeping up their, um, uh, their dividends. So a lot going on there. Next slide. You know, when I get an industry like this and I really don't understand it, I always sort of search around to find out how the industry operates. So over on the left-hand side, I just was searching in Google and I tried, I know this was in FinTech, I knew that they were doing some information technology and I tried different names and businesses. I knew that they were really more a business to business. They're not necessarily coming into contact with us like say a square or block is where you go to a smaller company and you turn around and uh, you put your, your card in there and, and Square will take care of it. So I wanted to understand it. And there's some really interesting industry studies that some uh, people have put on out. And, you know, you can't always take the first one that's there, but I did find some really interesting ones. And I have some links to them at the end that we can go through. But it's just sort of a way to find some additional information. Next slide. So one of it was uh, McKinsey's uh, global payments. And the global payments does not mean the company. It means the industry in which they operate. And they were citing, um, uh, well, this is a Deloitte article that was citing this McKinsey payment report. And again, it's, uh, it's a link to all this. But just sort of what's going on with fintech in terms of these payments. You know, a lot of us are not using cash as much now post-pandemic. And you're going to see more and more of this in in a business-to-business -business environment, that's where something like global payments can survive and thrive. Next slide. Um, this is, comes from Global Payments' own uh, website. They're, these are the five seismic trends that they think are coming on. They think that there's a lot of buy now, pay later uh, kind of businesses, uh, being able to have more connected commerce, you know, where we're not using uh, paper or currency anymore, uh, digitization of payments, and also being able to protect their uh, data privacy. Those are the things that they think are coming on, and that's what they're looking at. Next slide. So here are all the links uh, that you can do, and again, download this, and you can look at them to your heart's content. I sometimes like to find stuff on YouTube where the CEO or someone from the company is speaking because they should be able to tell me what the company is doing in a very succinct 30 seconds or so. It's basically an elevator pitch. And there were a couple of them here that, uh, that were really pretty good at sort of outlining it. So take a look at those. Next slide. Um, here's the stuff from Morningstar. And these are the ones that are highlighted in yellow in the lower left. Those were the competitors that were in the stock to study article itself. But I was looking at them and thinking, okay, Block is there, but the other two really don't have that good of numbers with it. Uh, but overall, I found it uh, kind of interesting. And this is where it sort of gets into it is that there's not a really good comparison. I mean, Block is, but Block is actually more of a bank and dealing in a much smaller market than global payments are. But there's still a, not a bad comparison. Next slide. This comes from the CFRA industry report, and there's a whole bunch of them that are in there. 
But as you can see, this sub-industry, which is data processing and outsources, they have things that are dealing with centralized payments, which is what global payments is. But then they have human resources, so you're into paychecks uh, and stuff like that, payroll processing, outsourcing. Um, you know, So they have uh, Fleet Corps in here, which uh, we looked at uh, about a year or so ago. So it's a really wide and diverse sub-industry. So you have to be kind of careful, but that's sort of what I wanted to show you with this. Next slide. Um, I'm doing this in core, but I always like to show, uh, take a quick look at this in plus. And here we have a couple things that sort of stand out. Where the red circle is, there's no data for 2016. So it's like, what the heck happened there? And the other thing is that these are not the up straight and parallel lines that we're sort of looking. If you look at those trend lines, those faint lines next to all the dots, they're not really touching on many points, two or three times at best. And that's a little concerning to take a look. So we have to sort of investigate and see, is this okay or not? And let's do it with the next slide. Took a couple- Five minutes, Kevin. Thank you. Um, we had a couple, uh, very quickly, you were able to find out that uh, the first one where there was no data in 2016, it's because they changed their fiscal year. And so therefore it's gonna adjust. They had one fiscal year of seven months and then they have another one that's actually gonna be of 17 months. So it sort of adjusts things. And then also uh, some of those acquisition, the acquisition of total systems sort of jumps those numbers as well. So when you do, when you look at that, it's maybe not as bad as it looks. Anyway, that explains those two points. Next slide. So I'm gonna look at these with competitors. And what I decided besides block or square was to be able to look at uh, Fidelity National uh, Information Services. And, it's, and Fidelity has nothing to do with uh, Fidelity Investments. It's a banking company and then Fiserv. And if we look at the historic comparison, Block is in purple and they got some really great sales numbers that you go, wow. But if you go on to historic earnings and you look at it, uh, the earnings on Block are all over the place, whereas the other three are really quite consistent. Next slide. And then here we are on uh, the pre-tax profit debt to capital and return on equity. Again, Square is not there on the pre-tax profit. The others are all pretty consistent. Debt to capital, where they mount, bounce around a lot, they're all essentially in the same range, so that isn't so, so bad. And return on equity is kind of surprising that they're all sort of mid to high single digits. Um, the one that isn't is, uh, I think it's uh, uh, Fidelity National Investments, and that's uh, because they carry a lot of, a lot, a much higher debt. Uh, but other than that, uh, they're all about the same. Next slide. So what I was looking at is some of the secondary metrics. I like to, because I wasn't getting a good feel, I like to see what the free cash flow, total debt, shares outstanding and book value. You can only see this in plus. And what I've highlighted in yellow was basically when they acquire total systems, and that's three months basically before the pandemic. And so you can sort of see that. And if you look at it free, since that point, free cash flow and debt are sort of matching, that's okay. Shares outstanding are staying even, uh, and the, uh, the book value is staying pretty even. So it's okay. Next slide. So Two minutes, gonna, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, so when we look at the sales, I, uh, I went with 11 and 13.2, and uh, I use a preferred procedure for the earnings, but that's pretty consistent with where we are. Uh, the historic numbers for earnings are only 6.5, but if you look at a lot of the other metrics, whether it's on value line or CFRA or um, some of the others, they're all looking in, in, the, uh, in the low double digits. So I'm not too far off from where I am. Next slide. So I dropped Vice, uh, Fidelity uh, Information Services and Square because they just really weren't that consistent. And I just am looking at uh, Global Payments and Fiserv. And if you look in that red where I have the forecast high earnings, that's where I'm projecting the earnings at. And I've taken out some of the high PEs in the last couple of years because they were really kind of sky high. But with that, I'm sort of forecasting a high PE of 34.5, and that gives me a high price of 223.9. Next slide. And so if we look at the low price, again, I'm forecasting that red is where I'm estimating the future low price to be at 24, and I'm getting a low price uh, that's about 26% off the current price at 83.80. Next slide. 
So with our upside downside ratio, we get a 3.8 to one. Pretty straightforward. Go to the next one. And then our five year return, we're right at 15% with a yield of 4%. Um, I, uh, even though some of the payout ratios are much higher, I think it's gonna sort of stay in that range because the earnings will grow and they'll use some of that to be able to help pay off some of their debt. So that's sort of my conclusion on that. Next slide. So this is a new thing. This is a, a audit feature that you'll be able to see both in core and as well as SSG plus. And if you go back to slide 13, that's where the stock up for August is going to be about the new information. Um, and if you want to understand more about that, but that's something that some of us had in, in toolkit and has sort of finally been brought over. Uh, that sort of helps you sort of check to see where your judgments are and whether they're reasonable or not. But sign up for the one in August and you'll learn more. Next slide. Conclusion, medium-sized, steady growth company, well-managed. It's fully priced. I'm looking at a current PE of 32.5, and I'm only projecting a high PE of 34.5. I've had a buy, but not, it's a, maybe you could wait, be a little bit more patient, see if that price drops a little bit more. But it can be a candidate for purchase right now at this current price. So that's my conclusion. Thank you. And let's go to Cheryl and tell us uh, the first of the uh, SSG Plus and tell us all about Delta Airlines. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, the Delta Airlines uh, was the stock to study in uh, this month's magazine. It's also part of the BI Top 100. It's number 72 as of April 2022. There we go. All right. Um, again, my name is Cheryl Patterson. I'm in the DC regional chapter. Uh, I'm the president currently, and I'm also a member of McNova. Um, found Delta Airlines. It's part of the New York Stock Exchange. It's the undervalued feature in the July issue. And again, as I said before, number 72. Uh, you can also see it as part of the culture the Global Network and the Fortress Balance Sheet in S&P Moody's. Now I found uh, in the BI Magazine um, on page 32 um, that you can see the article that's on Delta Airlines. Uh, basically over here on the left-hand side, I've got some summaries for you that uh, the pandemic was really a black hole for the financial results of the domestic carriers, and that's really all the domestic carriers. The government and employer uh, imposed travel restrictions, employee illnesses have hammered the company, causing canceled routes, staff shortages, and significant losses. I think a lot of us experienced who tried to fly this summer, uh, those, all those things. Uh, Delta reportedly returned to profitability in March at the end of the first quarter. Uh, corporate management has predicted Delta will report a profit for the second quarter. Analysts believe there will be full recovery of the non-leisure bookings by 2023. Delta reportedly controlled costs when replenishing its fleets by mostly buying used aircraft, plus new ones when available at bargain prices. In 2021, the company reported having made commitments to take delivery of 264 aircraft over the next few years, and 70 aircraft were scheduled for delivery in this year alone. So hopefully that will help with uh, some of the cancellations. So far this year, the company has successfully passed along the added fuel cost through higher ticket prices. And management has reported that the price increases don't appear to be discouraging travelers from booking flights. And again, we can see this at the airports. Um, investor relations, uh, Delta has a, a large selection there. Uh, I wanna call out that on Wednesday, July 13th, uh, they are going to have their second quarter 2022 earnings webcast. And you can go to the website for Delta and sign up for that webcast. Now they're trying to uh, set up three uh, strategic priorities to get them on the path to recovery, uh, being strengthening their trusted consumer brand 
by continuing to prioritize health and safety of the customers, investing in the customer experience across the travel ribbon, and delivering best-in-class operational reliability and service. The second strategic priority is restoring their financial performance by rebuilding efficiencies, delivering midterm teen adjusted operating margins, and generating strong cash flow. They have uh, one of the strongest cash flows in the industry. Uh, again, the third is building a better uh, future for the people and the planet, uh, that they are going to put their people first with wellness. Uh, arm the people with technology and data tools to innovate and deliver for the customer and boldly pursue Delta's net zero sustainability commitment and closure diversity representative gaps. Uh, the track record of profitability growth um, within the adjusted total revenue, they hope to go from 2009 at 28 billion up to a 2024 goal of more than 50 billion. Uh, same thing with adjusted operating margins. They hope to go from that 2009 figure of 0.3% up to a 2024 getting into $7 billion. Uh, cash generation, as I said, they are generating some strong cash flows. Uh, going from 2009, we're at 0 0.1 billion and going into a 2024 goal of over 4 billion. And again, with net debt, uh, they want to decrease that from the 17 million billion rather in 2009, going down to a 2015 to 2019 average of 8 billion and getting down to zero in uh, 2024 is the goal that they have set for themselves. Uh, Delta Platform, uh, they are expanding their revenue ecosystem, uh, doing this through the products that they offer. Uh, Main Cabin in uh, 2014 represented 56%, while the premium products were 24% and other was 20%. Uh, again, they want to go into 2024 with only a 39% uh, in the main cabin, but increasing both their premium products to 36% and other to 25%. And this is through their loyalty, uh, cargo leverage growing, and uh, increasing engine volume with expansion of components and other travel revenue. Uh, the demand for the premium product uh, is going to propel their strategy as well. You can see in 2009, uh, premium seats and main cabin seats were really kind of neck and neck there, whereas now the premium seats have taken off in the 2021 future uh, statements and main cabin seats have kind of uh, remained uh, the same across. Uh, premium versus main cabin margins. Uh, they had the main cabin margin have a 10 plus point differential in the margin and the premium taking off to a much higher amount. Five minutes, five okay. minutes. We have the power of Delta and American Express partnerships. This is one of their largest contributors uh, to accelerating acquisitions and strong spend growth. And in 2024, financial targets and value creating far framework. Again, 2024, their financial targets is to grow revenue by more than 50 billion, adjust earnings per share by greater than $7, free cash flow greater than 4 billion, and the balance sheet adjusting the debt, the EBDAR, and the adjusted net debt to 15 billion. Again, confidence in positioning and multi-year strategy for both competitive advantages, industry leadership, brand preference, earning power, and financial foundation. Uh, here is the value line. Uh, talking, they, right now, they have a timeliness of three. 
uh, but you can see with the projections for annual total return, they're looking at a low of 16% and a high of 27%. Uh, net profit margin is moving ahead, as and the uh, right now the um, PE ratio is 14.2, whereas the annual they're projecting it to be uh, greater than uh, um, less than that rather. So right now it's, it looks like it's uh, overvalued. Um, here is the CFRA. They've got it as a four star and they think Delta is the highest quality legacy airline. And its a recommendation is a strong buy. Uh, here is manifest investing. And as you can see, the red line is the relative return and that is shooting up and then the par uh, being uh, is also going up there and the quality is the blue line and that is also in an upward trend as of April 2022. Uh, here is uh, the stock chart. Um, as you can see, they have hit bottom in July, uh, but it, it does look like it's trending slightly upward as are the momentum lines that are down at the bottom quadrant here. Uh, here's the SSG, um, aside from 2020, which we know what happened then with the pandemic, uh, they are on the increase. Uh, I made a forecast of sales at 5%, uh, which is uh, looking at the different uh, Morningstar and uh, value line, and also historical earnings per share. I forecast that to be 2.3%. They are, you can see down where the debt capitalization they're down pretty low and it looks like they are uh, buying buying off with their free cash flow increases. Um, here Two is minutes. Two minutes. All right, here's the uh, looking at the different uh, peers, uh, historical sales. Um, they're all pretty much keeping pace with each other uh, in these four different areas. Um, so they are managing to keep up with uh, the industry average as well. Here is the closing price of 29.53. Uh, they had no meaningful data in 2020, uh, but you can see here the average earnings, price to earnings ratio 31.3 with the current at 37.4. Again, that they are showing slightly overvalued. Uh, looking ahead, uh, I selected a forecasted low price of 22.1 and that was about 75% of the current price. And it does put it in the buy zone. Here's the looking again at the different zones. You can see the current price is right, just lower than it going into the hold zone. Here's some news you can use, uh, different uh, hyperlinks where you can get some news on Delta Airlines and the different airline news as well. And in conclusion, um, Delta is a large size growth company. It's severely com impacted by COVID, inflation, and global economic stability, but it's a well managed recovering company, uh, as we can see by the cash flow and uh, the different uh, partnerships that they have with um, uh, credit cards and also with their uh, increase in their um, prime seating. Um, DAL has the current PE again, it's slightly overvalued. Um, it stopped paying dividends in 2021, but has plans to reinstate. It's a buy up to $30.50, with the current price being $29.53, went upside downside of 3.5 to 1. It could be a candidate to include on a watch list to study, but you want to keep your eye on what's happening with the pandemic and the economic situations look to see when they start showing improvement. And that's it. Thank you, Cheryl. And last but certainly not least, let's hear from Janet Lewis on Generac. Go ahead, uh, Janet. Thanks, Kevin. Generac can be found on the heat map on Better Investing website, also in the ticker talks five and five. Next slide, please. Um, in the heat map, it's showed over 600 member studies, but I first found out about it in Ken Kabula's April 2022 ticker talk. Next slide, please. 
So what does Generac do? It's the largest player in a market with limited penetration, and it feels responsible to drive market growth in energy efficiency and sustainability. Next slide, please. These are from the investor relations presentation on their website. They design and manufacture a wide range of standalone and portable generators, other ge engine powered products for residential, light commercial, industrial, and also construction markets. And notice domestically 85% of their sales and only 15% international. Next slide, please. Their products are fueled by natural gas, liquid propane, which is the most efficient, and diesel and biofuel. But look at how much they have to do growing in just our United States. Um, they expect revenue to benefit from their investment in the energy storage systems, too, and power grid optimization. Um, they operate in two segments, domestic, which you see here, and international. And within each of those segments, the products are broken down into three classes, residential, commercial and industrial, and other. Next slide, please. They looked at the trends, reliability of supplies of energy are deteriorating, climate change is impacting all of us, Weather is more severe all year long now. Our system is a one-way one. It relies on fossil fuels and it's susceptible to power outages. We are way underinvested in infrastructure. We have penalties for carbon intensity and then we have incentives for renewable energy resources. Uh, we have brownouts, we have rolling blackouts, we have intermittency, we have power grid instability. At the same time, we have a rapidly increasing demand for reliable power. Everything's being electrified, so there's a dramatic demand for power now. That even goes to transportation. Look at the electrification of cars. Now we need charging stations. HVAC, water heaters, appliances, medical support machines are in homes as well as institutions. So homes are not just a sanctuary anymore. They're a place of business and health, and we demand reliable power. So we're they are looking at developing new technologies from 5G that is also going to increase demand. Next slide, please. Their business model uh, concentrates on developing strong relationships with their dealers. They have strong training programs for sales, installation and repairs, marketing. Then they have software control and management for energy, and they offer 24-7 support. Their goal, as I've said, is to be the most innovative and an ultimate solution for reliable, efficient energy. Next slide. Their sales and earnings have been strong over the last six years. Their cash flow is strong. Their debt is somewhat low. Uh, they acquire companies strategically to optimize their growth worldwide. Their growth predictions are favorable. Uh, Value Line predicts sales and earnings to increase above 15% by 2027 and a PE to 27 with an operating margin of 28%. Morningstar has them undervalued uh, on Friday. It was with a fair value of $275. Um, Brett Costelli is the equity analyst with um, Morningstar. And in May, he did something about the bulls and the bears. He said the bulls um, say that Generac is the undisputed leader in home standby generators with over 70% of that market share. They're expanding into clean energy via their acquisitions. They represent a large and growing addressable market. 
They're well positioned to capitalize on an increasingly distributed electric grid. The bears are saying, well, home standby generators face threats from home batteries to supply backup power needs. Generac's success in the clean energy business is not guaranteed given strong incumbents. But Morningstar thinks that Generac's efforts to become a leader in grid services and expand upon its Ecobee acquisition is potentially more fruitful. Next slide. So why is the price so low? Well, I think it's fear. Um, the market hates uncertainty. We're worried about rising interest rates, inflation worries. We might just be in a correction mode. Even our analysts are scrambling to estimate future sales and earnings, and that's their business. Um, and Mother Nature doesn't really care. Extreme weather events are becoming more commonplace, so the demand should remain solid. Um, they generated just over a billion dollars in revenue by the end of 2021, and they were expecting to raise prices in June. Uh, nevertheless, the price tag does make them a discretionary purchase, and it's one that's going to be affected by interest rates. So let's look at the fundamentals of Generac. It's a mid-sized revenue, but it's a high sales growth and earnings company. Next slide. Generac has high growth prospects and a cash flow. Yeah, it's, yeah. Its assets are well above liabilities, and it could possibly double in price in five years if all goes well. It does pay a dividend, and it historically hasn't, but Value Line predicts it will in five years, maybe in $6. It did pay one of $6 in June of 2012 and $5 in June of 2013. Um, next slide. Sorry, that was five minute call, five minutes. I thought so. <laughs> um, is this slide 11? Uh, let's look at these SSG. So these are my judgments. Um, please do your own, of course. I decided to be very conservative and use 15% for both my sales and my earnings. That's well below value line analyst and the company's predictions. I, I decided it was reasonable, though, because the challenges companies, all companies are facing right now in getting supplies, labor and transportation needs met. And of course, now the cost of fuel is, is an issue, too. Um, they didn't repurchase any shares in 2020, but the current board did approve a repurchase program for $250 million uh, through October of 2023. Over the years, it's been growing by acquisitions as well as through its products and services, um, and they're building an international presence. It will face competition as it focuses on clean energy products, solutions, and services. Solar is especially being one of them, but they are concentrating on solar storage, which is going to be wonderful when uh, when the sun isn't shining for five days and the solar runs out, you need to be able to get that energy back. During 2020, they entered the market for grid services, and that involved distributing energy optimization and control software that helps support the operational stability of the world's power grids. It's in the midst of the transaction, transition to an energy technology solution company. I think that distinguishes it from others. Unlike its peers, it has a primary focus on power equipment, but with a key emphasis on standby, portable, and mobile generators and broad capabilities across the residential, like commercial and industrial markets. So I feel comfortable with my 15%. Besides, 15% is all we need to double our money in five years if we buy at the right price. Next slide. Now you have two minutes. I prefer debt at 33% or low, uh, below, but I think Generac's debt level is okay because they have a history of paying down acquisitions quickly. They have good cash flow and strong management. Next slide. I 
Next slide. I also like that the officers and directors have skin in the game. Next slide. As the economy continues to be worrisome and stock prices are contracting, I felt better getting rid of those 2021 PEs as outliers. We're seeing prices become more normalized to currently near the 2021 low price. Uh, next slide. I decided to set 24 as my high PE. That was what I usually did before we hit nosebleed prices. Um, that high price result of 364.60 or 50, 364.50 there is uh, compared to Value Line's 460 three to five year prediction. Uh, Bolio, by the way, has a strong buy by 14 analysts. And then for the low price, I just went and rounded below the 52 week, week low because I felt like um, taking 80% of the current one was going to go too low. So I wanted to allow for market volatility. Uh, the 197.94 was the low price in Friday. So I just went on down to 190. Next slide. So the question is, is the company going to be able to achieve the earnings expected in 2022 and 23 in spite of the headwinds it faces during all these turbulent times? Well, Mother Nature doesn't give a squat about politics, interest rates, or the household budget. And our energy supplies are great, but unreliable. So we need safe, reliable energy. And it's rapidly becoming a necessity, not a luxury. And um, so I think that the reward risk ratio here is promising. Next slide. I, uh, full disclosure, I did buy some at 222.90 and then at 212 with a limit order. Um, I'd like to see those earnings pop back up nearly straight and parallel in the future before I buy more. Next slide. I think I've been pretty conservative in my judgment, so, but only time is going to tell. I do prefer surprises on the plus side. I will watch the competition. Next slide. So for more information, just hold your control key and click your mouse on uh, these links. Um, next slide. So in conclusion, I think that Generac is uh, maybe a medium-sized, fast-growth, con innovative company. It is well-managed. I think it's fairly priced, but it's trading near its adjusted five-year high average PE, high, average high PE. It's a buy up to 223.60 with a 9.6% total return and a three 0.3 to 1 upside down ratio with my price of 230 and 56, although today it ended at 222.83. It's a worthy candidate to add to your watch list or to purchase, but depends on your own analysis. That's it. Thank you, Janet. And you are now our 25th different person to make a presentation. Congratulations. Oh. Um, so now that we went through these very, very fast, again, make sure to download the handouts and the completed SSGs. And uh, now what we're going to do is we're just sort of going to ask each of the presenters to tell us where it sort of fits on the life cycle. And you may wonder what about the life cycle. And let's go to the next slide. This comes from T. Rowe Price, who talked about this about 85 years ago, that uh, that corporation has a life cycle like a human being and there's growth, maturity and decadence. And we'll see it on the next slide. This is a very common image. It's in the SSG Digital Handbook. But what we'll go through and sort of tell people where they are. Cheryl, why don't you tell us why you have that location for Delta Airlines? Uh, well, Delta Airlines uh, has definitely been around a long time. Uh, they started out in 1924. So they are definitely in mature growth. But they're also um, starting to do some things that really intrigue me. Um, not to push it further down the line, uh, such as their uh, partnership with American Express and uh, the fact that they are holding their, uh, controlling their costs by uh, buying airplanes on sale uh, and, and older aircraft. 
Um, so they're they're doing some things that are going to push them ahead, and and also their uh, higher uh, free cash flow. Okay, uh, Cynthia, why don't you tell us about uh, FedEx and why you have that as its location? So FedEx is a long time um, growth stock, a company that's been around for a while. I like the fact that they are. Um, they have a new new head. They have new someone new in charge that's been around for a while, but he has more innovative uh, thoughts and ideas on his head. So he's that one that's going to push them over the edge and come from the old school and go to the new school and bring in your robotics, bring in your drones, your automatic. I like the fact that right now they are looking to uh, invest uh, $2 billion in the initial investment in vehicle electrification. So they are looking to help the economy, um, the cl the climate. So they, they're looking at new things. So I like the fact that they're an older company. They've been around, they're strong in their strength, but they have new leader in charge with new innovations and new thoughts. So I see them as a mature group, but they're not stabilized yet because they're ready to move into this 21st century with new ideas and innovations. That's why I put them there. Okay, thank you. Janet, why don't you tell us why you have this as a location for Generac? Well, I think Generac is in the explosive stage of growth because it's concentrating on innovative solutions to providing clean, safe, efficient energy and control of that energy. And there's so much growth going on technology-wise and power-wise, so many incentives going on right now. They had their IPO in 2010, and I think they have really just beginning to tap into their future growth. Um, they they have so far to go just in the United States, not even counting internationally. Okay, and global payments, while it's been around since the uh, mid to late 60s, um, it's still, I think, right at sort of the cusp of uh, explosive growth and mature growth because of the fact that we're doing a lot more um, cash, uh, non-cash transactions where we're going business to business or we're not using cash and currency. And so they're also focused on the medium to large size companies, which is where they get the biggest bang for the buck. So that's where I put them there. Let's go to the next slide. Hey, Kevin, I have a yes. question before I move on, if you don't mind. Oh, hold, hold on for a moment. We're going to have, before we do questions, we want people to vote. And we'll do that um, right now. So, Cheryl, if you can be able to put up our poll, we'll do that. And everyone can go ahead and vote just once. And we'll see how things are going. We got about 50, now 60% of you voting, getting up over 70. That's good. 74. See if we can get ourselves up to maybe over 80. We get there, maybe, maybe one more vote will get us there. I think we're going to have to close it off. Go ahead. Oh, we did get to 80. Good. And if you can share that, Cheryl. And there we are. We like Generac more than anything out there. Okay. Um, so with this, I think, uh, Richard, do we have any, uh, we did have someone jump on there. Do, any questions or whoever that was speaking, if they wanted to ask your question now, you can go for it. Yes, this is Matt. Uh, if you go back to that um, T. Rowe Price scale, I think it was the previous slide. Uh, uh, yeah, the one with, yeah, the T. Rowe Price's life cycle, I wanted to ask. You. So um, even though they're not the, um, subjects for this evening or the stocks to study. I was curious to ask, where do you think companies like Microsoft and Apple fit on to that, fit on that scale? Are they explosive growth or mature growth? Well, first of all, a lot of it is a personal preference. It's sort of like how much sugar you like with your, uh, with your coffee or you don't like sugar at all. But I think we would probably see uh, depending on looking at it, there are some aspects of Microsoft that are still showing some some great future growth, so those can go on there. But it really takes a, a look into the study, and that's the reason why, you know, if you dig into and look at the um, the company and you start understanding what its growth story is, 
then you can sort of be able to figure out, are, is there still a growth component? And as Cheryl pointed out with uh, Delta, while it's been around a while, some of the innovation that they're doing, it may still have some more life left in it. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Kevin, we got we have uh, one question, one comment. All right. Uh, we have from Robert Greenstein a question uh, for, I think it was uh, Cheryl presented the stock. Uh, for Delta Airlines, how does earnings per share growth rate become positive when the current numbers are negative? Uh, again, we are projecting five years into the future when we do our projections. And so looking at uh, how their revenue is growing and their free cash flow, that right now, looking at the different resources uh, for projections, uh, they are saying that they will get to be positive within that five-year period. Okay. Thank you. If there are no other questions, we have one comment from Ayama Messiah who noted that uh, global payments dropped to $112 a share today. So uh, that might be uh, something to look at. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I that's do have a, a question. about a less than 1% uh, on uh, on today. But yeah, just uh, being patient. Uh, I think someone else jumped on there. Was that uh, whoever it was? Yeah, we've had, we have three hands raised. So okay. uh, Gerald, go ahead. Gerald Jenkins, go ahead first with your question. Oh, yes, uh, I'll go ahead. Uh, this is Jay Allsworth, really. I um, oh. wanted to ask, with Generac trying to expand internationally, what do you anticipate to be some of the challenges with uh, the European market in terms of regulation? Again, uh, this is an area that uh, a lot of companies have really had to struggle with. Actually, I really don't know. And you're right. I, th I think there are a lot of things that a lot of countries are struggling with. Um, and not, that doesn't even take into account what COVID did to the world. Um, but I really don't have an answer for you on that. But if you find out, I'd like to know. Okay, because I think that might hinder their uh, expansion uh, internationally with that uh, regulation component. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Richard, are there other questions or hands raised in the uh, in there that we can take care we, of? We have three uh, hand raises, a Matthew Cohn, Elizabeth Hall, and a Karen Wilson. So if they'll present their question. I think Matthew already answered his. He was there, but okay. um, how Karen about Wilson is Karen? Karen. Only one. Hi, this is Karen Wilson. I just wanted to ask, sorry, you probably said it, but how do you download the presentations if you wanted to? Okay, so the handouts are right here. So all you need to do is click on each one and then as as they populate into your, uh, where you've got your files stored, you can decide where you want to load it, download it to. Uh, so you do one at a time. Um, if you're having problems with that, um, uh, um, you can then uh, contact one of us. You're going to have emails later on um, uh, to uh, get have us send you the uh, the download mechanically. Since you're having, if you're having a hard time with it, sure. also if you um, go to uh, go to slide seven, it may be easier to show them uh, when you see the image on on that. So if you just click, se if you hit seven and then enter, you'll get there. Okay. Just hit, hit uh, seven on your screen or on uh, uh, on your keyboard, and then hit enter, and you'll get there. I think. Okay, it's not. Oh, there here we go. Thank there you. So this may be easier to see, but if you look down where the handouts are, that green arrow, it's a pop-out window. So if you have your window closed, you're going to have to use that orange arrow up in the upper left of this image and pop that out and then you can be able to then click on that the handouts where cheryl sort of move your cursor so that she can see where the handout is um and then oh, okay. I just, yeah does that make okay. sense thanks i see it yes okay. thank you 
Okay, and just do them, as I said, one at a time and be patient. It will then open up where your files are stored and then you can put it where you want on your computer. Okay, thank you both. All right. Other questions? Let's see. Richard? I guess I should unmute. Nope, that would be it. Okay, I'm going to try to go back Jeez. here to where we were. Nope, we were down lower than that. Uh, Does anybody remember the page number? Try like one, we on? 111, 112. And All right, closer. one more. All right, go go up to go back up, go back to 112. So anyway, this is um, this is if you want any additional comments or questions, we have a um, uh, an email dedicated to digging into the BI, or you can reach any of the two uh, uh, chapters. And there's a picture of those of us that were down at Bink. There are eight of us from the two chapters that were down there uh, that are directors or active in our chapter. So. There we are. Next slide. Um, and if you want to be able to be on our mailing list, if you're not already, uh, you see some people are on multiple times. It could be that you're sharing it with someone else. Go ahead and sign up for the, you don't have to be a member of the DC regional chapter, but go to the DC chapter and fill this out. Um, and uh, you'll be able to be on the email list. And that way you'll have your own registration number uh, or name for next time. Next slide. Uh, Kent, do you want to tell us about volunteering and all the good stuff that happens there? Sure. Probably need to go to the next slide, though. Oh, wait. Anyway, there we go. Uh, so the Maryland and D.C. chapters uh, are entirely run by volunteers. As you heard, when this effort uh, is going, this is all a volunteer effort. And so if you would like to help, you can become a chapter volunteer and you can get all kinds of benefits in addition to the uh, feeling good that you're helping others learn how to uh, learn and earn. You can also get some other more tangible benefits uh, with discounted rates and uh, access to lower cost events. So that's it. Okay, let's go to our next slide. We're going to have a. We're going to come back in just a week, and what we're going to do is this will be a special one where we look at the selections from when we started in November of 2020 through December of of 2021, and we're going to look back at some of the selections, and we'll have some, not all of them, but some of them, and sort of see what we did right and what we did wrong. Um, so come back and join us. There's an email that went out on that. We'll make sure another one goes there, um, and come see us and. We can sort of look at what we did right and what we did wrong. It's how we learn. Next slide. And in August, our featured stocks are going to be Sonos is a stock to study. United Rentals is the undervalued feature. And then we have two more. One is CarMax and the other one is Monolithic Power Systems. So that's going to be on the first Monday of the month. So that's going to be August 1st. Uh, come and join us for that one. We'd love to have you. And finally, one more. Um, you can always visit us on YouTube. And again, that's a hyperlink that will take you right to the YouTube channel. So thank you very much, everyone. Any final thoughts from anyone in the uh, in the back room here? Actually, Kevin, I just thought of another question. Does the SSG show the buy, hold, and sell zone for any particular stock? All of the ones that, are, that we have SSGs for will show you what they are. Those, remember, are our judgments, and we recommend strongly that you do your own uh, study and research, but you can see what we thought of. And as a BI member, you can also look at First Cut and see other people that have done presentations as well. Are you are you a member of Better Investing? Not a paid member, no. Okay. Okay. Well, there's a free 90-day. How, um, how, how much does it cost to join? Um. I, it depends on the, the stuff that you have, but there's a 90-day free trial. If you download this, it will show you the link for that. It's one of the early slides, and you can be able to take a look at that. Do you live? Where do you live? Do you live somewhere in the Maryland, D.C., or Virginia, or somewhere outside that? Yes, yes, yes. I live in National Landing. Okay. 
Uh, so that national landing is help me out. Uh, Crystal City by near DCA. Okay, very very good. See, I I live up in Baltimore, so I I, I don't get down to DC as often as I did when I lived down there. Anyway, um, yeah, Crystal yeah. City is Arlington. Yes. Um, well, you can be if you want to learn more. Um, again, take down those contact information and Cheryl's our chapter president and she can be able to help you with more. And like I said, with this handout, you can very easily um, uh, get a, f a free 90 day uh, subscription just to see how things operate. And then you can reach out to uh, people in the DC chapter and they can help you well, whether you're interested in joining a club or doing it on your own. It doesn't matter. We're here to be able to help you become a better investor. Anything else? There's one question from a Sarah Cornwell. Cornwell, does anyone track the BI suggestions over time and see how they do? Um, well, every every issue of Better Investing, they they go back and look at their previous ones. And for the undervalued feature, they're expecting it to be able to grow by 20% over, uh, around 20% over 18 months. And so at 18 months, they'll go back and they'll look at the stocks that were uh, recommended from that. And then the stock to study is something that they're looking for, for something along the line of, of five years. So five years after it's originally presented, they will have a, a follow-up story to see how they do. And that's one of the things we're going to do next week is we're going to look at what our initial judgments were and what happened. So some of them we did really well on and some of them we didn't do so well on. Of course, we couldn't have predicted this kind of a large drop in the market, but these things happen. Hopefully that answers the question. Sarah says thank you. Thank you, Richard, too. And thank you, Sarah. Okay. I think that should be it. We're pretty much at the bewitching hour. We don't like to go much further than this. Uh, come back and see us next week, folks. Glad to have you. Good night, all. Good presentation. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us.